Yeah, Zach. Yeah, Zach. You guys notice that Caleb was missing a couple weeks back? I mean, it, when we got them all here, you can tell they're all here. I mean, you know. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Every now and then we're missing Zach, and sometimes we're missing Caleb, and every now and then we're missing the Reeds, sometimes we're missing the Kimseys. When they're all together, it's, you can tell it all fits together the right way. You can tell when somebody's missing out of the praise team. I can't. I mean, you're missing the, missing the bongo drum. You're missing the, oh, he's getting pretty radical back here on the snare set. But, yeah, I don't know what we're going to do. Some of these kids get a little older. It's going to be interesting to see who fills their, their spot. I'm just ho- praying that God leave them in this area. Zach wants to be a lawyer, and I get tickets sometimes, so I'm hoping that maybe traffic will be part of it, but we'll see, you know. I don't know if he'll end up doing that or not. I think Caleb wants to be an accountant. They're famous for doing books, and if you've know, got former military experience, you do a little wet work in between, according to all the movies. I mean, they're all, you know, they all whack this guy, do a little accounting, you know. So. <laughs> Melissa over here has pursued quite a few different things. I don't know what she's going to end up landing as, but she's highly, highly gifted. Highly gifted. Whatever she does, whoever gets her, is gonna is gonna have a good worker. It's gonna have a good mom and a good wife. And Clay over here, we're, I mean, he's still work in progress. You guys know that. I mean, the apple don't fall far from the tree. College age behind you guys. Appreciate you guys today. A lot of these kids been in my group down through the years. I, I ran into another one, kind of a blast from the past this week. Over 20 years, you start running into people that you had in your youth group that have kids now. You're like, boy, I'm really getting old. I might need to, might need to do something different, but, man, he just won't, he won't remove the burden from me. What, what a, this generation may be the greatest generation in America. I mean that. I know there's a lot of skepticism, but I don't believe it. I don't believe it. All it takes is just a little bit of difficulty, and all of a sudden we could see this generation awaken, do things that we could never imagine. Uh, the potential is there. Look at the freedoms that we have. What a country, right? What a country. Well, I'm a little bit tired this morning. Uh, I, I would call it probably running on fumes, uh, but anybody that knows me knows I don't go to bed at 9 o'clock very often, so it's not, it's not abnormal for me to be up at 1 in the morning. It is abnormal to be at the office at 1 in the morning. But here we are. I have not been privy to all of the messages that Ben has preached out of First Peter because I'm downstairs about half of the month in Children's Church. Case, it's good to see you. Miss you in Sunday school. I, I'm not privy. You know, I'm just not privy. Hey, hey, good to see you, bro. Glad you're here. You could have missed both things. I'm giving you some attaboys. I mean it. I mean it. It's good to see you. Wouldn't be the same without you. I've been privy to all the messages, but you kinda, you've gotten a theme from Ben out of 1 Peter. I mean, it's pretty easy if you read 1 Peter. It, it's kind of this, um, you know, pr- preparation, the, the people are having difficulty, they're going through some difficulty, some trial, uh, some persecution, and even though we don't face that a lot in our nation, unless uh, you're willing to say something that probably isn't politically correct anymore on Facebook, you might face some persecution, some defriending, but overall, we still got it pretty easy in this country, honestly, compared to the rest of the world. But, but uh, you know, we're talking about that in this letter about difficult times, being able to endure them. And these people were legitimately going through some very, very difficult times. And so chapter 5, I I was here uh, able to listen to Pastor Ben talk about this admonition to these under-shepherds, these elders within us. And if we're not careful, uh, us pew-setters can get to the point where we kind of put the people that are in charge up in these pedestals, and we shouldn't. I mean, what... Whatever requirements in the scripture are on uh, someone that's an elder is on us also. We, we need to view that. I mean, it's not an us and them. It's an us, all right? And the requirements that are in scripture, no matter the position, we should feel under the weight of those things. Now, there are some special um, rewards that will come to those that serve in some of these positions. The scripture lists those. But the demands of those positions should be assumed by all of us that set the pews. And I'm one of them. Okay? And so we get chapter 5 kind of gets started with this uh, admonition to to the leadership that is going through these trials. And now he's going to broaden this out to us pew sitters. Okay? 
Uh, let's stand for the reading of God's word in 1 Peter chapter 5. We, we only have a couple of verses, and I, Paris just barely drug out of bed today, and I told her I wouldn't put her to sleep, so stay with me, girl. All right, 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 5. Likewise, you younger people, submit yourselves to your elders. Mm. It seems like nowadays this is in short supply. It's interesting, the last two generations of America, how little tolerance and respect that kids nowadays have for people that are older that may hold different views to them. There is a transition going on in America. I don't know if you can see what's going on, but it is going on, right? You can see it in the entertainment. You ever sit down and watch a show? Dad's always dumb. Mom's always insensitive. The kids always know the best. They're always right. Mom and dad's always dumb. They're always wrong. They are transitioning this. Now, we could reread this in 2021, and it would say elders, you know, elder people submit yourselves to the young people. That's not the way it is, right? There is wisdom involved in this process, and it's, and it's the truth. There, no matter your age in here today, there, there is something to be gained by placing yourself in subjection to those that are older than you. I am very careful. It happens occasionally, but very rarely will I ever correct someone that is older than me. Very rarely. Most of the time as a young person, it's far better for you just to be quiet than it is for you to speak. If I could learn that lesson, I'd be far wiser than I am today. There's a lot to learn. Listen to me. I know media and I know the TV shows are all telling you young people we're all a bunch of morons. But with age, there is experience. So much loss. You know, I, I was sitting with my, uh, my stepdad the other day at Taco Bell. We was talking about some ideas that we have. And Keith said, we were talking about how I brought it up. You know, when you go to a young person's funeral, they always say, man, look at the potential that was lost. Because we're used to people living to be 90 or 100 years old. You go to a person that's 85 or 90 years old, what, what do you hear at the funeral? Well, they lived a good life. It's probably time that they pass on. No, it's not. We, we just make that assumption because we're used to people dying at 90. What if we lived to 1,000 and they died at 90? We'd say, what potential was lost? It doesn't matter what your age is to, to not today in this building. There is something to be gained by placing yourself in subjection to those that are older than you. There is always something to be learned. You are wise, the scripture says here, if you submit yourself, you younger people. Yes, all of you. Now he broadens it. Be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility. For God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, let's humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, uh, the devil uh, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may, now listen, this word's important, devour. Resist him steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world, but may the God of all grace who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus after you have suffered a while. Perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. To him be the glory. And the dominion, if you were at church camp with Todd Walters, you remember this word. Dominion. Now listen what the verse says, though. To him be the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated. Today, I, I don't title a lot of messages, but I titled this one. It's called Honorable, Honorable duty. And, and when we talk about honorable duty, almost immediately we're going to think of someone that's in one of the branches of the armed forces because we, we refer to their service as honorable service. You got an honorable discharge, you got a dishonorable discharge. It is a honorable duty for someone to serve their country no matter the job. We give special accolades to those that wear a combat uniform but we all serve our country. It is honorable for you to work, to serve, to love, to submit, 
and to encourage the community that you live in. We live in great freedom. What a country. Honorable duty. So let's turn our attention. We've talked about the elders through Pastor Ben's message, and now we're going to finish out, broaden this out to you and I. The first thing that you see in verse 5, if you go back there, look what it says. Likewise, you younger people, submit yourselves to your elders. Live as a servant. The first point we see in verse 5a is just to be in subjection to superiors. It may be at the job. It may be in the classroom. It may be in the home. Young people, old people, middle-aged people, there is something to be gained by placing yourself in subjection to those that are superior or he wouldn't command it here. You may not agree with everything, the positions that you are under. You may not agree to all of the decisions that your boss may make, but there is wisdom in this idea of subjection to superiors. Listen to me. If you are going to have the title of one who has honorable duty, this is not an option. If you look at the people that you look up to in the faith that are finishing well or have finished well, this was modeled by them. You'll see it when they're young, when they're middle-aged, and when they're older. There is a willingness to subject themselves to those that are superior. Secondly, be in subjection to the same, to the same. I had to make it rhyme so you can remember it, like me. Look at verse 5b. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility. Subjection to the same. If you look up same in the dictionary, you get this word, equivalent. You know, I may have difficulty submitting myself to the needs of, let's say, Paris, her soccer game this week. She's going to have a game. I'm going to go to the game. I may have difficulty submitting to that if I don't consider her an equal. When he says to submit yourselves to one another, this idea of equivalence is what keeps us in the right frame of mind. I have little difficulty when things are right between me and God, being submissive to others because I consider them my equal. We get to a place, maybe sometimes we say, I'm just not going to do that job. I'm above it. You're considering that person not an equal to you. If we are going to humble ourselves to one another and love each other properly, we have to consider one another the way we are, equals. If you're not careful, we'll elevate some people above others just because of the title or position that they have. But we need to be careful not to do that. Or we create a mindset in our heart where we're unwilling to submit to some and we're willingly able to submit to others. We are equals in this building, in there, out there, at work. They're humans. God has given us his spirit, his image his word. Let us do it willingly. There's nobody in this room that I consider lower than me. They are my equal. And as long as we will keep that mindset as a pew setter, we can willingly submit to one another with ease. Number three, be in subjection to your Savior. The last part of verse five, he transitions this and focuses on God. Look what it says. For God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. And boy, is it mighty. That he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him. For he cares for you. Be in subjection to your Savior. This phrase is used a couple of times in the New Testament where it talks about God resisting the proud. This is an active antagonist. I have the spiritual gift of this. If you hang around me very long, you know I'm an antagonist, all right? 
I almost can't help it. It's a, it's a fault. As Peter was a denier, I'm an antagonist, all right? If you're around, I'm going to egg it on uh, way too, for most of the time, way too, way too far, and, and then I, then I got to crawfish and apologize. This is what God is an active antagonist. He is actively working against those that are proud. This isn't something that he sets to the side and says, well, I hope they finally get what's theirs. He's working against you if you are a proud person. Now listen, he's an active antagonist to the proud, but listen, he's also actively assuring the humble. Look what it says. He gives grace to the humble. This is an active situation. He, he is an antagonist to the proud people and to those that are humble. He is an active assurance to those that are humble. Listen to me. When you are at your weakest in sin, he is at work with the goal of reconciliation. He's not passive. If you're involved in something right now today that you know is out of bounds with God, he's not sitting over there hoping you'll figure things out. He's an active antagonist, and his goal is reconciliation. He will not leave you where you are. And if he has to make your life miserable, he'll do it because the goal is reconciliation. He wants you. When you are at your lowest in humility, he is at work with the goal of exaltation. Look at verse 6. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. If you humble yourselves willingly, he isn't setting to the side saying, well, I hope he gets something out of this because he's doing the right thing. He, his goal, his objective in the process is exaltation. If we're willing to humble ourselves, he is actively working to exalt you. It's not, I hope they get something good for the work they're doing. He's going to make sure it happens. That's the goal of the humility is that he might exalt it. Number three, when you are at your limit in anxiety, and boy, do we get there. I think men, we accuse the women of this a little, probably a little bit too heavy. I have a lot of anxiety. I don't think I've ever been as nervous as an adult man that I am right now in my life. And I, we can sense it. I can sense it. I can tell something's wrong right now in our country, in our nation. We can sense when something's wrong in our home, men. When you are at your limit in anxiety, he's at work with the goal of reassurance. Verse 7, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. This isn't day to day. The mindset in this verse is that we give our entire life at one time. We cast all of our cares. This isn't, okay, I get to this day and I'm anxious and nervous about this moment. I need to make sure I turn to God. It's from the very beginning. I'm just going to give it over to him. I know that he cares for me. No matter what I have to deal with in this life, I know he's going to be by my side. I don't have to keep doing this every day, giving my cares over to him. I've already done it. I don't know what's in front of me or what's behind me. I do know what's going to come. He's the victor. Listen to me. When you're at your limit in anxiety, you cannot take another moment. You're just stressed to the limit. He is at work with the goal of reassurance. Cast your care upon him because he's already actively working to care for you. It's not setting to the side, hoping you'll get what you need. If you're in an anxious moment, he's already working to give it to you. He's actively working. Live as a servant. Young people and old people alike, if you'd like to make it to your finish line, no matter how many years you serve on this planet, if you're going to be an honorable duty person, you've got to live as a servant. There's no option. Let us humble ourselves. Be in subjection to superiors, be in subjection to the same, and be in subjection to your Savior. Would you like to finish with a good name? I do. This isn't an option. You must live as a servant. Number two, we've got to live as a soldier. Verse 8. Look how he changes the language when he moves into verse 8. Be sober, 
Be vigilant because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. There are other passages. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 13, if you want to just flip over a few pages. Ben shared this when we started into this study on 1 Peter, but look at it again. Therefore, gird up your loins of your mind. Listen, look what it says. Be sober. He transitions from this servant mindset to this soldier mindset. i got to be ready to go at any moment. I mean, there's no slacking off here. I can't, I can't just kind of get lulled to sleep. The first thing that we see here is this identification of our adversary. And let me just point it with, with this title, Respect the Enemy. Okay, I know that a lot of cartoons picture the devil as a short guy with a big pitchfork, but none of those are true. He is a very powerful angel. And we know the kill power in the Old Testament of not even an angel of that power in one night. Over 100,000 men. Respect the enemy. Now listen. Firstly, don't underestimate him. He's powerful. But secondly, don't give him too much credit. You ever been around somebody that everything happens in their life, it's always the devil's fault? Listen, the devil's powerful, don't get me wrong. But he's not all present, and he's not all powerful, and he's not always messing with you 24-7. Sometimes it's just your own sorry self. Don't underestimate him, but also, listen, don't give him too much credit. Respect the enemy. And thirdly, just because I like to dab a little bit, don't tarry in his territory. It talks about the devil as this lion. We're going to get into this a little deeper in a moment. But you can't get ate by a lion if you're not in his territory. And listen, guys, we get dirty every day. It's just a part of life. But don't tarry in that territory. Or you might find yourself swallowed and excreted. Don't tarry. Listen, keep short accounts with the Lord. If you go to tarrying in his territory... You might end up a snack. Recognize the enemy. Respect the enemy in verse 8a. Recognize the enemy in verse 8b. You still with me, Harris? Yes. Yes. Look at this, 8b. You ready? Like a roaring lion, and I, I paused when I read this on purpose, seeking whom he may devour. Now listen. When you use the word devour, you're not talking about a flesh wound like you would have in the old movie. Remember that, the guy? <laughs> okay. oh, it's nothing but a flesh wound. I mean, he's got no legs, no arms at the end of this thing. I mean, devouring isn't a flesh wound. Devouring is dead. I mean, it, it doesn't say resist the devil, you might get wounded. He says, resist the devil or you might get devoured. When you talk about the idea of devour, you're talking about a literal loss of life. We're not limping home to mom or limping home to the wife or limping home to the kids. We're talking about gone, a loss of life, literally consumed and then excreted, devoured. If you tarry too long in the territory, you might end up finding yourself gone. There is a loss of life with this idea of devouring. There's also a loss of learning. Now, I love these nature shows, all right? Uh, you, you, you see these little guys, and they're in, and then all of a sudden, and then they get one, right? They get one of those, and they, you, know, ee, ee, you hear it, ee, and it's screaming, and you just want to shoot. I mean, shoot the bear, shoot, shoot, the, shoot the thing. Just, just don't let it eat that little guy. There's a loss of learning. You know, when a lion takes something and it eats it, there isn't anything else to learn from that process. It's gone. Right? Wh whatever example that would have been to the herd later on, it's gone. And listen to me. If you tarry too long in his territory and he devours you, there's going to be a whole lot of people around you that's going to lose the ability to learn from you because you're gone. Number three, there's a loss of lineage. Now, I, I kind of made fun of the little leaping, you know, kind of bleeding noise of the little ones. 
But it is kind of sad how they always pick on the little, you know, the little baby. I mean, got a whole herd of animals, and he takes this one little baby out. And when he removes that little baby from the herd, he removes all its lineage with it. There's no kids to follow, no grandkids. There's nothing to look forward to, no inheritance. It's gone. And listen to, listen to me carefully. Some of us, if we're not carried, careful, might carry too long in this territory. We just won't lose our lives. We'll lose the potential of what might have come had we served God faithfully. You'll never know because you're gone. Respect the enemy. Recognize the enemy. There are four things that lions eat. The weak. The weak. The little babies. The ones that are frail. They go over there and get a hold of that sucker and put their mouth around its neck and just squeeze the life out of it. Because it's weak. And listen to me. If you're here today and you're a baby Christian, and you're weak in your faith. There's a roaring lion looking for the weaklings. There's strength that comes from this place. There's, there's a herd mentality here. And if you're weak, this is the best place that you can be in Bible study, in the home, around one another. If you're weak, you've got to get close to those that are in the pack that are strong. And with numbers, we might be able to protect you through that initial onslaught because it's going to happen when you're little bitty, when you're weak. Secondly, the lions eat the wounded. I was watching this. I think it was a water buffalo. A huge herd of these things. 5,000 of them crossing this river. And about a third of them had made it across the river. And right in the middle of the, they zoom the camera and you see this thrashing along. And out of the water comes this tail of the alligator. And you know that sucker just got bit. He's going bananas. And he fights and fights. And his nose is barely above the water. And he pulls them under a few times. And suddenly he gets free. He gets over to the bank and just drags himself out onto the bank. I mean, he got free of the alligator, his legs barely hanging on. And what's waiting on the bank but some tiger with his bib just got in place. Oh, look at that. There's a wounded one. Let's get him next. Ah! I mean, just like, I finally made it to the other side after the alligator got whammo. Ah! It just grows. I mean, they attack the wounded. Listen to me, if you're here today and you're a Christian and you're wounded, you're easier prey. If we're not careful, we can get a little crossways with one another, crossways with a neighbor, crossways with this guy, crossway with this girl, and if we're not careful in that wounded state, he might just devour you because you're just not as strong as you ought to be. Your mind's not where it needs to be. Number three. You got the weak, you got the wounded, you got the wayward. <laughs> this is the funniest one. You got all these, I like those little deer, that, they kind of bounce. You know, they don't even walk. They kind of doing, doing, doing. And then all the, you see about three or four hundred of them doing, doing. And this one's like, oh, look, a bush to nibble on over here. The whole herd's over here. And this one just doing, doing, doing over here. And out of the bush, <laughs> like that. I mean, if it would have just stayed with the pack. It just gets wayward for just a little moment. And. It's gone. Listen to me. If you're, if you got areas of your life right now that you know that are outside of the bounds of where God wants you to leave, live, you are easy prey. You're not where you're supposed to be at, and you're not doing what you ought to be doing. And along comes a lion wayward and lastly the weary there's always that one show where you got this old thing I mean he's just beat down and wore out his teeth are gone and the lion goes oh wow look at this a big old fat old dude I'm going to go over there and take a bite out of that guy because he's not going to fight back have you ever noticed that they don't even fight back most of the time it's like they've re God has built into them this just submission. That, that it's, it's my time. I'm just going to submit to this and let the thing eat me. They don't even hardly fight back from these old animals. They, just, they, they know it's their time. And listen to me. If you find yourself in that state today where you are old and worn out and weary and you think, you know what, it's just my time, you're going to get ate a lot faster. 
stay on your feet, stay moving, and you just never know. God may have something big in store for you that you could have never imagined. The best years are not behind you. They're always in front of you. Stay alert, stay on your feet, and pay attention. If it happens, it happens. But I want to go out smiling and serving. One of these days, one of these days, hopefully a long time from now. Zach smiled real big when I said that. I don't know if he's thinking about selling life insurance or what over here. Come on, bro. (laughs) Respect the enemy, recognize the enemy, and then he says in verse 9, hey, you still with me? Listen, resist the enemy. Verse 9, resist him, steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. I'm going to run quickly through this, but these are important points. I almost pulled this out for tonight's message, but I'm just going to move quickly through it. Persisting or resisting, excuse me, is active. You don't get off the hook on Tuesday because you resisted him on Monday. This is an active process. If you're not careful, you'll get wounded or weary or you'll get uh, distracted. And you have to resist him again. This is an active work. Resist through knowledge, 9b. He says resist through the faith. As you get older, listen to me, you should get better at resisting. If you're getting weaker as you get older in your faith, you're not with the pack enough. I don't know how else to say it. Because as you get older, you should learn how to resist better. We're not perfect. Good grief. Lastly, resist by example. If all else fails... I mean, you're, you're at your wit's end here. Resist by example. Look what he says. Knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. If you're going through a difficult time in your life right now, you don't see any end to it. Keep fighting because others are fighting on it. That's what he says. Get back on your feet. Get back in the fight. Live as a soldier. Lastly, we're going to look at this live as a sufferer. I'm almost done. You guys still with me? How you doing, Connor? Yes! <laughs> I told the kids about when Gerald Mitchell corrected me at Friendship Church one day. We was in revival, and uh, we were cutting up. I mean, Connor kind of dozed off a little bit there. I, w- I wasn't sleeping, but I was chit-chatting with my buddy, and Gerald Mitchell was a real hellfire and brimstone kind of guy. One time, he said this, this phrase. He was talking about women not dressing appropriately, and this is what he said. No, you BMA women, but not enough clothes on to flag down a bicycle. <laughs> I mean, he's one of those guys. They don't make them like that no more. They just don't. I mean, I was back there cutting up, chit-chatting, and, I mean, he stopped talking. So we stopped talking, and then we looked up, and Gerald Mitchell said, All right, son, you can stand up. So we stood up. I think it was at Friendship. I'd have to ask Mom. Now you can sit back down. Your mom will take care of you when you get home. <laughs> mm-hmm. I understand. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> Live as a sufferer. I'm so thankful, guys. I, I'm so thankful for these last two verses. D- just don't, don't give up on me here. Stay with me. Verse 10 and 11. But may the God of all grace, who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a while, perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. To him be the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. First thing you see here in verse 10 is the duration. There will be an end. I can't think of a better line to say during this point in someone's line on suicide. Suicide is a permanent solution to a temporary problem. It will end. No matter what you're going through right now, it'll come to an end. It will, even if it's very difficult things that you're living through. The duration is short. And then he gives the dynamics, the reward. He says if you will stay with him, he himself will perfect, confirm, strengthen. I love this word. He'll settle you. Live as a sufferer. And then, of course, there's the dominion. 
And anybody that's been at church camp when Todd Walter shared this message, you know of that fake snake that he beat the tarnation out of with that stick. It's <laughs> that, that stuffed snake. You remember that? He threw it down on the ground. He just took that stick. I just, ah! I mean, and he was talking about dominion. He was talking about the fact that God gave us authority over what he had built on earth and that we have dominion. Listen to me. There is a victor. All right? There is a victor. <laughs> and there will be an eternity of proper dominion. Remember, he told Adam and Eve, listen, I'm going to create all this stuff, and I'm going to give you authority to have dominion over it. And it wasn't 10 minutes. They messed it all up. What he gave us authority to do in the beginning on earth, listen, stay with me. What he gave us authority to do in the beginning on earth will be perfectly performed over all things forever. When the scripture says that he's going to have dominion forever and ever, we're not going to have to worry about a screw-up. And it's going to be over all things, not just this little corner that he gave us of the universe that we couldn't even manage properly. He's going to manage it all perfectly for all eternity. So what do we do with this bread? Do you want to have in your epitaph, your funeral message, whether you're 16 or 80, honorable duty as your title, you've got to serve. You have to. Submit yourselves. Subject yourselves. He's an active rewarder of those that do. You need to live as a soldier. Don't underestimate your enemy. Don't underestimate him. And don't tarry. And every chance you get, pop him in the mouth. Resist him. Resist him. And live as a sufferer. There are some things that just simply can't be explained on this earth. Some of you have lived through great loss. Loss that can't be explained and loss that doesn't go away. Live as a sufferer. The time frame is short. But he's the victor. We know how it's going to end. You can stand. We're going to read one more verse. Don't close your Bibles. 2 Timothy chapter 4. Just a few books over, Paul's talking to this little kid. He's just getting involved in the ministry. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 17. Listen to me. Hey, don't, don't check out. You, you, you did good. You've been on the train the whole message. Well, Connor missed a few moments, but I was watching. I didn't let you snooze too long, bro. I'm tired too, Connor. Listen to me. You ready? This old guy, this old guy is talking to this young guy about honorable duty. It's what we find ourselves context-wise in, in this chapter. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 17. Look what he says. But the Lord stood with me and strengthened me. Oh, oh, verse 16. At my first defense, no one stood with me, but all forsake me. May it not be charged against them. Paul is reminiscing about the first time he got into real trouble living for God. He said, nobody, nobody come to my defense. Nobody stood with me. I was all alone. Now look at the next verse. But the Lord, he stood with me. He strengthened me so that the message might be preached fully through me and that all the Gentiles might hear. Now listen to the language. Also, I was delivered out of the mouth of of the lion. There's been moments in my life where I was ready to be devoured. I was right next to it. And I don't have much. I don't have much in this life. But what I do have, I want to keep. And that's my name and my dignity. Now listen to me. If you're going to serve honorably this duty, there is going to be difficulty and suffering as part of this. And I don't know how many days we've got. 
Legacy is not determined by the number of days one lives, but by the impact one has with the days that they are given. And there may be some of us in here that are going to have a shorter life than others, but I want to encourage you today, just when you think all hope is lost and it's your time, or you've been distracted and he's on the doorstep, God can rescue you from the mouth of the lion and save your reputation and save your name and create a way of escape and keep you from that moment that would wreck everything that you've built. 25 years I've served you guys as a church. Almost. It's getting close. And the last thing I want to do is have everybody talk about the last three years that he screwed up in. But it's hard. As you get old and as you get weary, you start making mistakes that you didn't when you were younger. Listen to me. Young or old today, let's have some honorable duty this week. Show up. Suit up. Serve. Be a good soldier. And if you have to go through suffering this week, We know it's only for a short amount of time, and he's the victor. And if you're right in the jaws of that old lion, call out to him. He might just rescue you out of the mouth of the lion. Lord, thank you today for this encouragement out of your word. No matter where we're at in this life and in our walk with you, we can use this encouragement to stay the course. God, help us this week not to tarry in the territory of sin. If we're involved in things that we know are wrong, help us, God, to keep short accounts with you. And Lord, help us, our service this week, to be titled with honorable duty. Lord, thank you for this day to encourage one another. This pack is strong, and I gain strength from it every time I'm around them. Encourage us, Lord, today through one another. In Christ's name. Amen. Use the invitation how you see fit. Maybe you're weary today. Maybe you're wounded.